Today, we are embarking on a journey to uncover the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, a story that captivated the world. Join me as we peel back the layers of this mystery and explore the life of Natalie before that fateful night in Aruba. Natalie Holloway, a vivacious and ambitious young woman, hailed from Clinton, Mississippi. Born into a loving family, Natalie was full of dreams and aspirations. Natalie's vibrant smile, sparkling blue eyes, and compassionate heart drew people to her effortlessly. Her friends and family adored her, and she possessed a magnetic energy that left a lasting impression on everyone she encountered. She had just graduated from high school and was eager to embrace the freedom of youth before starting her college journey. Natalie's adventurous spirit led her to the tropical paradise of Aruba, a destination known for its beautiful turquoise waters, the sandy beaches, and of course, some wild nightlife. The journey Natalie embarked upon was meant to be a joyous vacation, a chance to create unforgettable memories with her high school friends. She relished the island splendors, basking under the warm Caribbean sun and exploring hidden coves. Natalie embraced the vibrant culture, dancing to the rhythmic beats of Aruba's music and immersing herself in the local way of life. However, Tragedy struck on that ill-fated evening. Natalie and her friends decided to venture out for the night, lured by the allure of Aruba's vibrant nightlife. Little did they know that this adventure would forever change their lives. I know what happened to Natalie Holloway. I saw that Joran was chasing Natalie into a small building under construction. With her, his arms, and he slammed the body of Natalie on the floor. I saw a crime passing before my eyes, but I was also, on that moment, busy with illegal activities. So. I didn't know what to do. Your high school graduation. Natalie left Carlos and Charlie's bar in the company of Yaron Vandersloot and Deepak and Satish Kalpo. First one to wake up. Two of our friends came up and found me, and they said, We can't find Natalie. We immediately knew something was wrong. And they've called Beth. I remember my reaction was Beth is going to be pissed because that's the consequence in my head for an 18 year old is you're in trouble. That was when I cried for the first time because I felt very scared. And so I was on that bus and it was really dark and none of my core group was on that bus with me. I don't remember what I said. I just remember being really tearful, not knowing what to do. We immediately knew something was wrong because she was the first one to wake up 
and when her roommates knocked on my door and said that they didn't know where she was, we went straight to the chaperones. Natalie, you can reach me on your cell phone. I have it, and it's set up for international use now. And I will stay here until I find you, Natalie. The first oddity in this case that I noticed that I had never heard before was that Natalie's room key had been used several times during the hours of when she went missing. Such as Natalie's hotel room door. It was opened three times in the night she disappeared with her magnetic key. Between 2 and 4 a.m., someone entered her room multiple times, as recorded by the hotel computer. The roommates were never questioned about the swipe card, not by the Aruban police and not by the FBI. This key card issue... Nee, dat is een cruciaal onderdeel van de zaak. Stel, Johan van der Sloot heeft er om het leven gebracht of was erbij toen ze op een andere manier stierf. Wat is het toen met de kiek? Is het iets wat moet worden that de volgende dag? Natalie's kaart toont dat ze came in en uit De andere roommates, laat me zien je kaarten. Wat voor kaarten heb je? Heel snel Aruban law enforcement could have resolved that issue and it appears that that's one more thing that may have been missed. Als de FBI niet alle meisjes of alle kinderen verhoord heeft en dat niet uitgebreid gedaan heeft, dan is dat slecht politiewerk. Zeer slecht politiewerk. That's one thing that was new to me when diving into this case after all these years was that I didn't realize that the roommates were never questioned and I also did not realize that Natalie's key in particular had been used and it was never looked into. They were on an all-inclusive trip, which meant all of their food, drinks, and their room was included. So they each had their own key to keep track of all their amenities. So did someone have Natalie's key or not? That's one question that's never been answered. get you more answers I'm sure about it I know it all right now the chip is it are there three separate conversations on this chip yeah three separate conversations when did they occur and with whom are the conversations uh, they occurred uh, about a month ago I think maybe longer two months ago longer and uh, yeah about actually about the person that the conversations with I don't actually really want to talk about <laughs> but um, yeah that's just uh, I was just giving that to you for you know, to collaborate, as that you could actually see and have something to show to go look look into this. That was my. Uh... You met a guy in February of three years ago who said he was interested in something. What was he interested in? He was interested in me bringing him a blonde girl. Where did you meet this guy? In the casinos in Aruba. What's his name? I'm Elher, and yeah, but I don't know if it's, I don't even know if it's his real name. But I've seen him over a period of one and a half years or something. Is he in Aruban? I don't know, I, can't, I don't know where he's from. What language? Um, and he said he wanted what? He said he wanted to see a blonde girl. What did you take that to mean? Uh, I had no, I did not even, when I wasn't even thinking about it, like I did not know what he, yeah, what he wanted any money. And what did you say? I said, okay, sure. I'm like a, like a high roller in there. And, Spending money like there like was nothing on blackjack and then uh, He was always talking about going out and you know, stuff. I know he, he he goes from Venezuela to Aruba. I know that That's what he was telling me at least and uh, yeah, did he ever say what he wanted a blonde girl for? No Did you have any sort of guess what it was? I mean were you, was it sort of the the code? You know you speak in code you sort of knew what he wanted No, no I wasn't wasn't really uh, Occupied with that at all at school going and I had other things at friends. I wasn't really uh, like I mean like I wasn't even concerned about his name to tell you the truth Joran Vandersloot a Dutch student living in Aruba at the time was the last person to be seen with Natalie Holloway 
As the investigation progressed, Vandersloot's involvement in the case became increasingly suspicious. Vandersloot initially denied any involvement in Natalie's disappearance, but his statements contradicted witness accounts. He claimed to have dropped her off at her hotel after a night at a local bar. However, Natalie had vanished without a trace. Van Vandersloot's father, Paulus Vandersloot's, support for his son began to raise suspicions. There were allegations that Paulus Vandersloot obstructed justice or tampered with evidence to protect Euron. The public began questioning his credibility and his involvement in the case. Many people came forward and there were many theories, most of them with dead ends but the ones without dead ends lead back to Vandersloot. Continuing our live special report on Yoron the Ripper, let's go to Aruba, <laughs> where Craig has found a witness who claims Yoron's father did help him bury Natalie Hull. Yes, Craig. Pearl, though some of the information that came from that failed FBI sting on Yoron Vandersloot was that he had his father help him in the cover-up of Natalie's death. There was a huge break in the case on the Geraldo Rivera show on Fox News. There was an eyewitness who came forward who said that he saw Euron and his dad at around 4 o'clock in the morning. Pearl, though some of the information that came from that failed FBI sting on Euron Vangisloot was that he had his father help him in the cover-up of Natalie's death. On what appeared. Jay, tell me what you saw. Well, uh... It was uh, 4.05 in the morning, and from the left side of my house, I saw a uh, long uh, male, tall male, tall male, with uh, very skinny uh, hair, and he was walking to my house, and he was missing a shoe, humping on, on, on a foot, he was uh, very tired, exhausted, he was... Uh, wet from from the chest down it was 4 a.m may 30th 2005 the night of natalie holloway's disappearance jay claims he was awakened by barking dogs suspecting a burglar he yes, investigated I saw, I saw him just beneath that light hole that light post jay's home is located a short distance from where natalie was last seen alive this is where i saw him for the first time According to the FBI, Euron claimed he hid Natalie's body after she hit her head and died. He went home to tell his father, who accompanied Euron back to the location where his now-deceased father, Paulus Vandersloot, further concealed the body, returning a few days later to bury Natalie's body at a construction site. Jay believes he did see Paulus that night when he came to pick up the soaked and sneakerless Euron. Describe the vehicle. What did it look like? It was a, a, a red jeep, a red jeep, and the cap was was white. It was it had a white cap. Describe the man coming up toward your house from this area. He was a middle-aged man, white, and he was uh, looking from left to right like crazy. And the, 
the young Dutchman was sitting in the car behind, beside him. Did you come forward to authorities then? No. Why? Because um, in the same article, it explains that his father is a lawyer and he's going to be studying to become a judge. And his best friend is Jan van Straten, who's the chief, chief police at that time. Mm. So you didn't come forward because you were afraid. I was concerned because three days after Natalie disappeared, they, they caught some uh, security guard and falsely accused them. So uh, it wasn't uh, very encouraging to come forward. In 2008, a Dutch crime reporter named Peter de Vries conducted an undercover sting operation using hidden cameras. During this operation, Jorn van der Sloot made incriminating statements that implicated him in Natalie's disappearance. In this instance, he suggested that she may have died accidentally and that her body was disposed of. Bitches just come up to me and they ask me, are you going to come out with us tonight? Will you, will you come with us to Carlos and Charlie's, the bar? I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I had already been drinking the entire time. So we go to Carlos and Charlie's. I get there and you see this entire group of hot girls. And she just came down from on top of the bar. She just came up to me. Who? Natalie. Come take a jelly shot at me. So the whore jumped on the bar and she wanted me to take a jelly shot out of her navel. I, I did it. <laughs> then she says, now, so now you have to buy me a drink. So I say, what do you want? She says, what's good? I say, a shot of Bacardi 151. She says, okay, that's fine. So she takes a shot of Bacardi 151. She takes it and right away she goes, whoop, bam. You know, 151 proof, you know. 151 proof, that is. That's 75% alcohol. So she asks for a chaser. She's drunk. She's drunk. Really drunk. But I was thinking, uh, I'll just take the girl with me. We'll go. And uh, to uh, so I say, what do you want to do? You want to want to go to your hotel? I'll just go with her to her hotel. That's the best thing to do. She says, no, no, no. I don't want to go to my own hotel. The shot. So I was with her, and I said to the guys, I, I want to go somewhere alone with her. The statements of Joran, Deepak Kalpo, and Satish Kalpo did not align with each other in the witness accounts. Their versions of events regarding Natalie's disappearance were inconsistent and raised suspicions among authorities. But she doesn't want to go to her hotel. I also kind of want to do what she wants. That's how it is, you know? I say, just drop us off at the beach. Then I'll f her and take her to the hotel after. So they drop me off at the beach. I get out and I walk with her to the beach. I'm kissing her and stuff. And she doesn't look so hot, you know? She was, she was looking kind of pale, too. But she wanted it. She really wanted it. He says, just as they begin making out on the beach, Natalie's condition takes an alarming turn. And she has her hand down my pants and stuff. And all of a sudden, Patrick, like like a movie. All those things she did? Shake it. Yeah, like a lot. So I, so I was like, what is all this? So what'd you do then? Yeah, so, so I stay with her. And, and, and there was nobody there, Patrick. Of course there's no one. At night time, you know. So, so, so I'm talking to her, talking to her, talking to her, and she says nothing. She says, she says nothing. She says nothing. So, so I take her. How long was she shaking like that for? Do you know what that is? I don't know, Patrick. An epileptic attack or something, dude. I, I don't know. She was shaking a foam too out of her mouth? No, no, no foam out of her mouth. Not that I saw. And, and then I, I'm panicking, you know? I, I just thought, no one even knows I left my house. I just left the house like that. So, so I'm thinking, what, what do I do? Based on the evidence from the hidden camera recording, Joran van der Sloot was arrested once again in 2010, this time in Peru, for the murder of Stephanie Flores Ramirez. He confessed to killing Stephanie in his hotel room after an argument. However, he later recanted his confession. In 2012, Joran van der Sloot was convicted of the murder of Stephanie Ramirez and sentenced to 28 years in prison. In the case, after five days in police custody, denying repeatedly that he killed Stephanie Flores, the young Dutchman broke down in admitting to murdering the 21-year-old Peruvian student in his hotel room after a night of drinking and gambling. The bombshell confession came late last night 
Under intense questioning, the 22-year-old Euron reportedly told investigators that he attacked Stephanie Flores. He grabbed her by the neck when she took his laptop, he said, and started reading articles about him on the Internet. I did not want to do it, he tearfully admitted. The girl intruded into my private life. She had no right. I confronted her. She was frightened. We argued, and she wanted to get away. I grabbed her by her neck, and I hit her. This morning, sources tell ABC News that Duran will take investigators to the scene of the crime, the Tack Hotel in downtown Lima, to show them how he attacked Stephanie. Throughout the investigation, authorities have been carefully documenting, videotaping every step of their probe, including a search of Joran's belongings. La policía tiene ya su computadora. Police now have Joran's laptop, says Stephanie's father. It contains valuable information that may lead to more of Joran's victims. Que hay más asesinatos. I think he killed many others, he says. Stephanie. In this video, we're only looking at the Joran Vander Sloot. <laughs> Take two. In this video, we're only looking at the Joran Vandersloot aspect as far as a suspect. There's been many suspects, many theories. Natalie's parents suffered from one false lead after another, one trip to Aruba after the other, never finding Natalie's whereabouts, never getting any answers. Natalie's mother went to many places on the <coughs> island asking about her daughter. One of the most memorable was her actually going to Joran Vandersloot's house. Let's take a look at some of what Natalie's parents had to endure in that horrible time. Anybody home? Hello? Is anybody home? You got company. Knock, knock. Hi. No, no, there's somebody. Hi. Hi. Anybody home? There's a guy right there. Hey. I see you in the bushes. Hello. We just want to give you some cards. Hi. I'm, I'm Natalie's mom. I just want to give you a prayer card. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Natalie's mom. Please come, come in. Yes. Okay. Come in, please. How do we come in? Uh, Hi. Yeah. Greta Van Susteren. Yes. Thank you. This is Beth. Yes, come in. But please come uh, stop the cameras, okay? Okay. Yes. I feel like for me, it was just the affirmation of yes, he possesses knowledge of what happened to my daughter. I mean, it gave He me, meaning Paul or yes, Yaron? He meaning Paul. The father. Yeah. I think that was my affirmation. When I left that home that day, I felt 100% certain that yes, he has information. And the lovely Beth strikes again and confronts Deepak Kelpo at his place of business. He was working at an internet cafe at the time. And she went in and said she needed to get some photos developed. She ended up being there for about an hour and a half. The biggest questions that I have is, is um, Yaron committed these sexual assaults against Natalie in the car. We know with Deepak and Satish in there. And, uh, you know, I just ask him, did you try to help Natalie? Or, or did you participate? And, uh, you know, he, he can't even answer that. He, he would just either refer to it with silence or his attorney told him not to speak with me. And uh, I just can't imagine, given that opportunity, he would not want to take advantage of it to clear his name with, with Natalie's mother standing right there in front of him. Um, so you, so you that, went that to just, this Internet cafe and asked him about the reports of the sexual assault or the rape in the car, and he just simply refused to answer. And I can't refer to it as rape, but I can refer to it as sexual assault. That's as far as I can go with it. And... Um, uh, you know, I know that there, there, some were occurring. Um, you know, he would not, no, like I said, either answer me with silence, would not look at me. I had to keep telling him over and over again, pick your head up, look at me when I'm talking with you. I, I, you know, I'm trying to help you. You know, look at the damage that you were 
Yeah, look at look at what he's doing to Aruba. I mean, I didn't call him a liar, but I can tell you, in in the hour or hour and a half I was there, I asked him repeatedly, repeatedly. I was very persistent, and I did not stop. I, you know, we have to have answers. I, you know, I kept reminding him. You know, we've got two hundred and fifty thousand dollar reward for the whereabouts of Natalie. We're offering a million dollars for her safe return. Um, you know, we're giving him lots of choices, opportunities to come forward and do the right thing. I offered him to please come on one of the shows with me, yours tonight. You know, do what you clear your name. But um, you know, that just shows that just shows some huge level of guilt and involvement. He cannot even look at Natalie's mother. He can't. He can't even deny it. You know, I could see maybe not admitting, but he. I'll tell you, he looks sick to me. He looked sick with worried. All I saw were his eyelids the entire time, except when I would tell him he had to look at me. That's all I saw. His head was down. He was nervous. I mean, he was just continually, you know, going back and forth to the computer, just frantically typing, just senseless typing. I could see where I was seated. Um, it, there was just senseless typing. He was just, just, it was almost that fright or flight that someone gets, but he couldn't flight. So all he had was fright in there. But I'm encouraged by the fact that he is watching. I think he's got a vested interest in this case. You know, because I thought it was unusual. The one question that he did ask me, and this was probably 10 minutes before I was leaving, he told me, he said, the media has not seen this side of you. And uh, I told him I'd been saving it for you, Deepak. <laughs> what, what side is that? I think it's just a side that I, I will stop at nothing to get answers. There is nothing that I won't do. There's nowhere that I won't go. And there's nothing. I'm going to ask every question. I don't care how painful it is. I will do it because I'm not going to have any regrets. And there are too many people that have been supporting me and they want answers too. So if I'm in the position to ask them, I need to, I need to take advantage of it. Joe, I've got a lot more days on this island, so I'm not going anywhere. I've got plenty of time. So I've got lots more pictures to be developed at the Internet Cafe. So it's <laughs> going to go slowly. Yeah. Um, so you, you plan on going back there? Well, absolutely. I've got more pictures to be developed. Yes. I'll... <laughs> it's a great place to go. Also, I've got to go back because I was so saddened that Natalie's poster had been taken down. And his owner, this is what Deepak told me, that, his, that his, either his manager or boss made him take it down. Yeah, so the well, um, so... only thing I know to do is go back and try again. Obviously, I don't need to say this. Natalie's mother's strength was amazing and still remains amazing to this day, as we're going to see in just a few minutes. But let's take a look at Natalie's dad, Dave. Yeah. Um, it's horrible. I mean, it's like it was pure hell down there. Tough conditions. We went through a lot uh, in Aruba, and, and it's still going through it. Uh, very difficult times. Who, who's, the, who's corrupt? You know, I can't put my finger on it, but there's a lot of red flags about at least one individual, probably two or three others. When, you, when, when did you first arrive on the island? I arrived on the island June the 1st. And Natalie disappeared. She was out with her friends on the 29th and then got into the car early morning and hours of May 30th. 30th. Is that right? That's right. So you were there in very, very short order. How, how did you find out that Natalie was missing? Uh, my son called me late uh, that afternoon on Monday and uh, it indicated that Beth has uh, returned from Hot Springs and was on a jet flying to Aruba. And at that time, you know, it's like... Uh, what's happened and uh, so we uh, tried to call to Aruba, uh, called the police, couldn't get anyone to return our calls and I booked a flight out for the next morning and uh, once uh, some of the students got back they'd indicated that Natalie had left with uh, three individuals and later on I'd learned uh, through math that uh, her airline ticket had been rebooked and it was done as a precautionary measure so that she wouldn't miss that flight. So I ended up getting there a day later. So you were hopeful that she was just getting another flight coming home for yes. all you knew? Yes. When you got there, um, there came a time when you were asked for money. Who asked you for money or asked you if you had any money? Well, let me back up a little bit. When we arrived on the island, we immediately rented a rental car and we're looking at two days after she was uh, reported missing. I went to the first police station. I asked the, uh, the, the lady in charge at the front desk. I said, I need to speak to the detective who's in charge of, of uh, Natalie Holloway's case. And she asked someone to come up there, and they summoned about 10 police officers up there, and they didn't know anything about it. And then finally, once looked at the newspaper, and he got excited. And, you know, most of Rubens are very, very helpful. And he got excited and says, there it is, there it is in the newspaper. 
and it struck me that I said, boy, something's wrong here. So they directed me to the other end of the island. I got lost, ended up at another police station, same story. Didn't know anything about Natalie's disappearance. When we walked in and met uh, the lead detective. Uh, Who was which one at that point? Dennis Jacobs. Okay. Uh, I identified myself, and I was obviously stressed out at that moment. And the first thing he says, uh, well, how much money you got? And it's like, I like fell out. And our brothers looked around and couldn't believe it. And then we finally settled down, went off in the back room, and he told us, well, just go on down to Carlos and Charlie. He said, uh, this happens all the time. People come up missing, and they miss the flight, have party too much, and so on and so forth, and just go down there and have a beer. And I was thinking, well, you know, what about a search? And I was told, uh, well, why would you want to do that for? And I said, well, don't that what you normally do when someone's missing? He goes, no, nah, I'll just go on down there and have a good time. But he said, watch your drink. That's one thing you better do watch, your, watch drink? your drink. Why? He said, people put stuff in it. And he told us that several times, GHB. Um, and uh, you think if he'd put money on the table at that time for the police, would that have made a difference, you think? Well, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I've wondered about that in the beginning. You know, my brother's also wondered about that. It came up a second time, probably three or four months later, he asked us how much money we had. Now, I thought he was asking for reward money that Natalie was located. And, um, and then he changed, kind of changed the subject when I didn't catch on. Dave Holloway, you probably knew before all of us that this guilty plea to murder was going down the prime suspect in the murder of Natalie, Natalie Holloway, Alabama beauty and honor student there on her senior trip. Dave, reaction to the guilty plea in court just hours ago? Nancy, I was just happy to see that the uh, Flores family finally got justice. I just hope that on Friday that he gets the proper sentence that he deserves. As I said earlier, Yoren Vandersloot received 28 years in a Peruvian prison. Just recently, June of 2023, breaking news that he was being extradited to the U.S. to face charges of extortion. Let's dive into the extortion aspect from Joran Vandersloot to Natalie's mother. John Q. Kelly, the Holloway's longtime attorney, met with Vandersloot in Aruba. He took me to the location where he said Natalie was, was, was buried. About a week later, he indicated that it was all a hoax, which was sort of his M.O. along with everybody, get the money and then say it's a hoax and, you know, avoid criminal prosecution. The person this was an opportunity to hold him accountable without being able to pursue something more serious. That's right. Originally, this looked, you know, like something that you would characterize as being awful but lawful. And then as the team digged, uh, began to dig deeper, they realized, no, there's a prosecutable federal crime here. Cuffs were removed and he was handed over to U.S. authorities. Now all eyes turn to the courtroom where the Holloway family hopes the truth will come out. Natalie's mother, Beth Holloway, releasing a new statement. As a mother who has tirelessly pursued justice for the abduction and murder of my precious daughter, I stand before you today with a heart both heavy with sorrow and yet lifted by a glimmer of hope. Beth Holloway is expected to be in court for the arraignment later today, and Joran Vandersloot also expected to plead not guilty to two charges that would carry up to 20 years in prison if convicted. And now we're brought to current day. Joran Vandersloot was in court on June 21st, 2023. You're absolutely right, Brittany. You know, 18 years and this first court appearance only lasted a couple of minutes, but enough time for Joran Vandersloot to stand before a federal judge and enter a plea to the charges of wire fraud and extortion. Now, this we were here this morning when the team of black SUVs arrived delivering Vandersloat to the federal courthouse. We watched federal prosecutor Lloyd Peoples arrive, and we also caught a glimpse of Matt Holloway entering the courtroom. He is Natalie's brother. Now, cameras are not allowed in the federal courthouse. But just Joran Vandersloot arrived at the Hugo L. Black United States Courthouse 
The arraignment took place at 11 a.m. Vandersloot is charged with one count of extortion and one count of wire fraud against her mother, Bethany Holloway. Yoron was escorted in handcuffs and he was wearing a white Michael Jordan t-shirt and jeans. Natalie's mom, Beth, her dad, Dave, and her brother, Matt, were sitting just a few feet away from the suspect. Beth's determined expression never wavered as she watched over Vandersloot as he shuffled into the courtroom. The entire hearing lasted less than five minutes. At the beginning, the suspect turned down the services of a Dutch translator. Vandersloot said, quote, my English is actually pretty perfect. Judge Gray Bowden asked him if he understood all of his constitutional rights and the extortion and wire charges. Vandersloot responded with a yes, sir, each time. He waived a reading of his two count indictment and pleaded not guilty through his attorney, Kevin Butler. The prosecution asked that Vandersloot remain in U.S. custody because of the treaty it has with Peru, where he still faces the rest of his sentence in a murder case. He was held at Hoover City Jail Thursday night of last week, but was moved to Shelby County Jail after the arraignment. We expect this to probably last a few years. He is able to be here and remain in the States for three years. Ja, dat, dat, ik denk toch voornamelijk uh, aan jezelf. Meestal aan mezelf, ja.